Hi, this is Dick Wall from Escalate Software, and in this screencast we're going to look at a few of the remaining changes in Scala 2.8. Okay, let's take a look at another change in Scala 2.8. This time we're going to look at the way packages work. Now there are some differences from Scala 2.7 in the way that packages work. Uh, it's probably easiest just to describe how they work now, uh, and the rest of it will fall out if you already use 2.7. This will hopefully help you make sense of why some of the packages uh, usages patterns have changed a little. So what we're going to look at here is a simple example of a, a rocket with three different stages in it. Uh, this is actually taken from the Programming in Scala book uh, by Venners, Odersky, and Spoon. Uh, and it's, it's slightly adapted for our uses here. So what we've done is we've got, uh, and this is the what we call the C-sharp or the .NET style uh, of package definitions that Scala allows. So there is, in this file, an overall package that all of the rest of these definitions fall into, and that's com.escalate. What this statement will do is, within this package, it will make anything available that is in escalate, but not anything available that's in com, unless you explicitly import it within this package. So what we've got here is access to the escalate namespace. Then within here, we can nest more packages. And in this case, we nest a package called rocket, which has a class called boost3 in it. We Inside of that, we nest a package called launch, which has a class called boost2 inside of it. Then we end the launch package and we come out to another package, navigation, that also has a package launch in it, and that has booster one in it. So how would you use all these? Uh, the examples are down here, and in interestingly, we can now actually close the first package, and then we can open another one. In this case, I've used the same name, but you could actually define multiple packages inside of a single file. So it's very flexible what you can do now. Inside of this one, though, what we want to do is we want to be inside of the rocket, inside of navigation. Now, what happens here is that the last package in each of these chained package descriptors, if, it's, if it is so chained, is brought into the namespace. So in this case, we have access to the escalate namespace, the rocket namespace, and the navigation namespace. And that means we can use the classes, the booster classes, like this. So we've got class mission control, and mission control defines three values in it. The first one is launch booster one. The way it finds that is because we have the navigation namespace imported, it looks around for launch, it finds it, and it can find booster one. The next one, Booster 2, has Rocket Launch Booster 2. It looks around to see if there is a rocket in scope, and sure enough, because we actually have the Escalate namespace, uh, we are in uh, Package Rocket, so we could actually uh, use this guy. And then inside of Package Rocket, we have Launch and Booster 2. So this is going to Package Rocket, Launch, and Booster 2. The third case, Booster 3, is actually defined directly under Rocket, and because we have Rocket as a package uh, that is the end of the chain, or in this case on its own, it is able to see Booster 3 directly. So this is very familiar to .NET developers as the style of uh, packaging and namespace that C Sharp uses. There are other ways you can use it in Scala though, so let's have a look at another option. So mission control, let's make this a little bit bigger here. Uh, mission control 2, this is another form of this. It's a little bit more like the way that uh, you used to seeing in Java, but with a couple of extras. So we actually specify com escalate at the top. This brings in anything in the escalate namespace. And then we specify another package rocket and another package navigation. Now this specializes this package each time. So inside our right here at this point we are inside of com escalate rockets namespace and we have access to everything that is available in rocket as well as everything that's available in escalate and down here we are in the com escalate rocket navigation namespace and we have access to everything in navigation in addition to these other two. So we've kind of specialized it and done implicit imports on the way down of what's available to us. And then you can write mission control to in exactly the same way as we saw before. One more option 
uh, that's available and I think is probably a little bit more explicit, and this is very much what you would expect to see in the Java side of things, is this, where we actually specify the full package up front, just like Java does. So we're in com, escalate, rocket, navigation. And then because we want everything in the escalate space and everything in the escalate rocket space, we import those. And so this and the other two examples are basically all equivalent, and the style is up to you to choose whichever one you prefer. Okay, let's take a look at another new feature in Scala 2.8, continuations. Now, continuations can be a little bit confusing. If you don't understand what they're used for, uh, you won't be alone. A lot of people don't, but if you've been waiting for continuations in Scala, then this is going to make you happy. I can show you how to use them. So a continuation, roughly speaking, is defined as the rest of my execution package or execution function that hasn't yet run. And so the idea is you can actually interrupt execution of a function uh, and come back to it later after you've done something else. Uh, an example of the way Scala does this, and as I say, don't worry too much if you don't follow this, uh, is to basically, uh, I, we can define this result. Uh, what the reset here does is sets up a scope for the continuation to run within. Uh, so that's what this is doing. And then the shift is actually the part of the continuation that gets run, and anything outside of the shift is what runs later. Now, in this case, what we're actually doing is we're saying that what runs later, this thing called k, for the sake of argument, uh, is something that takes an int and returns an int. And that literally is this multiply by two that's going on down here. So what we're saying is the rest of the stuff that we're not executing right now is simply a doubler, a multiply by two. And what we do inside of our continuation is to call k four times on one. The first time it will return two, the second time it will return four, the third time it will return eight, and the fourth time it will return 16. And that's shown down here. Now, in order to, in order to use continuations, you need to do a couple of things. You have to import the continuations uh, package, which uh, or the, the, the contents of the continuations package, uh, but there's a little bit more that you need to do. So let's take a look at that. So if we go to our project and bring up the module settings in Idea, what we get is, and I'll move this into the script into the window so that you can see it. What we want to do is look at the Scala uh, settings, and what you need to do here is actually bring in this path. Uh, wherever you've installed Scala, let's actually edit this guy so you can see it. Wherever you've installed Scala, you'll find underneath the MISC Scala Develop Plugins Continuations uh, Plugins directory a continuations.jar file. So you need to add that to your list of compiler plugins, and it's called continuations. And then you need to enable a flag that says dash p colon continuations colon enable. And if you do that, that actually makes uh, continuations available to you. So let's see how this works in practice. We can go ahead and build this guy and run it. And there we get the result 16. So again, that is how you actually invoke continuations. Uh, they're very useful for a number of things. One area where they get used a lot is for kind of wizard style interaction on websites. And if you're interested in learning more about it, take a look at the Small talk web app framework Seaside, which uses continuations for a lot of this stuff. Uh, and there's various uh, resources around the uh, internet on how continuations work. But anyway, that's how you set them up and use them in Scala. Okay, so the final couple of things to cover for Scala 2.8 changes are changes to the way implicits work and a mention of the packrat parser. So first of all, the implicits. Actually, implicit rules are pretty complicated. Uh, the compiler will help you understand when you violated some of these rules. But the important thing, this now works and didn't used to work, is that you can now do this. You can say it.reverse, uh, first of all, it.reverse comes back as a string. Now, I didn't used to do that. It used to come back as a wrapped string in Scala because in order to 
apply reverse, which is not a, an operation on a Java string, it would have to put it into a rich string or wrap it into a rich string. And so that's what you got back. And the impl implications of that were if you did it dot reverse dot reverse equals equals it, in Scala 2.7, this would come back as false because the result of this part of the uh, expression would come back as wrapped string. This is clearly a Java string. And because of the rules of equals, you can't have one equal the other unless the other equals the first, and that would have violated the uh, the rules for equals. Now, because it actually does uh, use implicits to return a string, this actually comes back as true, which is a much less astonishing outcome uh, and a good move uh, all round for understandability in Scala. This is very typical of the separation of Scala complexity from the people using the APIs and the people writing them. Uh, this is a pretty difficult thing to pull off from a library point of view in a statically typed language. But from a user point of view, it just works as you would expect it to now. The other thing worth mentioning is packrat parsers. Uh, packrat parsers are a new kind of parser for the parser combinator functionality in Scala. And basically what parser combinators let you do is write pretty sophisticated DSLs without having to resort to a full grammar generator as you would in most languages. And really the only difference you'll see with Packrat is that it runs, it runs faster and it can now handle some situations that it wasn't able to before. For example, expressions nested inside of expressions, which in the past could have resulted in a stack overflow. Uh, so that's about it for the Scala 2.8 changes. We hope you've enjoyed these three screencasts and we will be producing more screencasts for Scala education purposes as part of our Escalate soft work. So keep an eye out for those and see you soon.